Hello, my name is Ling Tak Nianda Chan, I'm Professor of Pharmacy and Nutritional Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. So today we are going to talk about blood and more specifically, we'll talk about how micronutrient associated anemia affects our patients receiving parenteral nutrition. So let's start with anemia. What is the impact of anemia on health? Now, according to the NIH, about 3 million Americans are affected by anemia. So it's a very common disease. Anemia affects red blood cells and red blood cells are critical in delivering oxygens to tissues. And so without oxygens, we develop ischemia and other tissue injuries. So maintaining optimal red blood cell count, it's a good thing. Anemia is a condition with decreased number of functional red blood cells. Another condition is sometimes a patient may have mild anemia, but it's not managed, and it turns into a chronic disease. Now, studies have shown that chronic uncontrolled anemia also has other long-term health consequences, and it can lead to heart failure and other long-term health issues. So preventing anemia is an important uh, process. Bringing back to the topic, patients receiving chronic PN are also at risk for developing anemia. Now, the question is how? Now, before we address that, let's look at the process of blood cell synthesis or hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis takes place in a factory. And you can think of, think of our bone marrow serves as the factory for blood cell synthesis. This is where all the magic happens. So patients who have bone marrow suppression or bone marrow failure will not be able to make adequate blood cells. With a functional factory, of course, we have to supply fuel to keep all the moving parts working. And the peptide erythropoietin is the fuel, and it comes from the kidney. And that's one of the reasons for patients who have chronic kidney disease, especially those requiring hemod hemodialysis, develop anemia. And that's because when the kidney failed, the kidney cells will not produce sufficient amounts of erythropoiesis, or erythropoietin, pardon me. So even if you have a fully functional factory, it would not be able to keep up with the supply. Now that we have a functional factory, we have fuel, of course, we have to have supply chain. And what are the raw materials necessary for blood cell synthesis? We can think of five in general, iron, vitamin B12, folic acid, copper, and zinc serve as the critical components, raw materials to support hematopoiesis, including red blood cells. Now, how do they fit into the picture? Let's look at this diagram. It is, of course, a simplified version of what's going on. But we can think of zinc as a critical component to drive cell differentiation and cell division. It basically tells the stem cell that while you have to differentiate and including participating in the red blood cell line, are the nutritional elements critical for cell proliferation and differentiation include vitamin B12 and folic acid? And that's why patients with B12 or folate deficiency tend to develop clunky red blood cells. They don't divide as much. Once the cells start dividing and move into the red blood cell lines, we need to make hemoglobin in order for the red cells to carry oxygen. As the name tell, hemoglobin contain iron. And so we have to have adequate supply of iron for the body to make hemoglobin. In order for us to adequately absorb iron, we need copper as copper regulates intestinal enzymes to process iron absorption. And in fact, copper is part of the antioxidant system, which may also help prolong the lifespan of red blood cells. So collectively, this is a very, very brief summary of how these five nutritional elements support hematopoiesis and prevent anemia. So going back to the original question, how do patients with chronic PN therapy 
develop anemia. Of course, they can have factory or supply line failure. So bone marrow disease or kidney disease can contribute to anemia. But by far, the most common cause of anemia in patients receiving chronic PN is in fact micronutrient deficiency. And iron deficiency is the most common findings. And that's because iron is not part of the trace element admixture routinely added to parental nutrition. So in the patients who, 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 are, who is not able to eat adequately and not receiving any IV iron over time, anemia will happen. Other micronutrient deficiency can occur if there is an increased body loss, such as high ostomy output, increased mobilization in response to injuries or other metabolic demand. And of course, in the last decade or so, um, a new factor that complicates our patient care plan is product shortages. How do we assess micronutrient deficiencies? We can think of three key processes. Number one, history. I always emphasize history. Look at a patient's underlying disease states, how they present well-being, and then look at intake. Intake give us a good assessment of whether there is adequacy or deficiencies. With continued deficiency, a person may develop clinical signs and symptoms. Some of them are more specific towards uh, a particular micronutrients. So physical exam would give us some guidance. We want to validate our findings with objective tests, such as laboratory tests. Anemia will be reflected by a complete blood count with low hemoglobin concentration. Other laboratory tests specific to individual nutrients can also be considered as listed on this slide, ranging from iron study, assessing copper status through serum or plasma copper, and seroloplasmin, a copper-containing protein. Methylmalonic acid or serum cobalamin can help assess B12 status. And then folic status, folic acid status can be assessed by plasma concentration or red blood cell concentration, depending on our goal and what we try to investigate. And zinc plasma concentration may also be helpful in specific patients. Once we have treated a deficiency, and it is important to perform surveillance monitoring because that help us prevent the recurrent of deficiencies. How do we approach treating micronutrient deficiencies? Uh, there are a few things we can consider. First is that in patients who are able to eat and more importantly, absorb nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract, oral or enteral administration is still a feasible and viable option. And in fact, that's probably the most practical option for patients. Now, if the absorption is incomplete, or oral administration is not able to fully replenish the deficiency and prevent another episode of symptomatic deficiency, then intravenous or intramuscular supplementation would be the next consideration. A couple of things to take into consideration. Adding micronutrients into the parental nutrition bag may not be an option for a lot of micronutrients, because of the concerns of solubility and compatibility. So please make sure to check with the pharmacist and make sure that this is safe to administer. And because of that limitation, one of the more likely intravenous approach would be using a supplemental infusion. Now, of course, that would involve coordinating the infusion schedule. If the patient is on a 24-hour infusion PN schedule, that may have to be changed to cyclic. And we also have to balance the fluid, um, fluid load from the micronutrient supplementation as well as the parental nutrition. And finally, there are micronutrients that can be safe and effectively uh, administered through intramuscular therapy, such as vitamin B12. And that would be another option in patients who are not able to optimally absorb nutrients from the GI tract. Once we have identified deficiencies, we have to treat. The general approach and the goals are fairly straightforward. 
if patients are symptomatic, we want to reverse the symptoms as quickly as possible. At the meantime, we want to replace the deficiencies. And the most important thing is we don't stop. We continue to replace the physiological deficit and replenish the reserve. And then most of all, we want to find out the cause or causes to make sure that it doesn't happen again. This may include other interventions or changing our feeding regimens. So let's summarize. There are multiple causes that can lead to anemia. Micronutrient supplies and balance is an important factor to prevent anemia, especially for our patients receiving chronic parental nutrition. Iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of PN recipients because it is oftentimes not part of the routine regimen. It has to be supplied or provided addition, in addition to the PN regimen. Product shortages presents another risk for PN recipients in developing um, micronutrient deficiency anemia. And most of all, early prevention and identification are the key to prevent disease progression as it would have a negative impact on quality of life and leads to other health complications. So I hope we present a brief story on the relationship between anemia in PN recipients. Thank you for your time. Thank mm -hmm. you.